we still have very separate conversations. We talk about CX a lot, and then we talk about customer journeys a lot, but it, it may sound obvious to a lot of you listening to this right now, but it really isn't. If you don't make an active effort to mesh those two topics together, they never meet each other. Welcome to No Hacks Show, a weekly podcast dedicated to letting smart people talk to you about better online experiences. My guest today is a customer journey optimization expert who spent a considerable amount of time over the past 10 years exploring the intersection between analytics and human behavior in digital platforms with one goal, understanding what makes people tick when they navigate interfaces. To me, that sounds like a smart person who can talk about better online experiences. So my guest is Andre Vieira. Founder at Looptimize, senior customer journey optimization expert and international keynote speaker. Andre, welcome to the podcast. Benvindo. Sunny, thank you so very much. It's a massive honor to be participating in this. Really appreciate the invite. As I told you before, I've done the homework. I've seen the guests you've had here. These are heavy hitters. So I feel like I have a duty to accomplish here, a duty to live up to. So yeah, let's get the ball rolling. Thank you so you much. You know for what? You're me. you're a heavy hitter as well. Like let let let's just say that. And when you say you've done your homework, you've done your homework like no guest has done before. Like I, I cannot wait to start <laughs> talking about this. And the topic for today is going to be customer journey optimization, of course, because you're the senior expert on that topic. Understanding friction and momentum. And before we start talking about that, you've been doing optimization one way or another for more than a decade? How long has it been? It's been well over 10 years. You're right. Well, I'm well probably on my 13th year as an experimenter slash optimizer slash CRO, call it whatever you may. That is very impressive. So let's start with me asking you, what are you not good at in this field? What I'm not good at in this field, I feel like I could improve a lot in interviewing people, like running user tests and so on I'm good with. But when I have to talk to the person on the other side and I see people like Else Arts, for example, doing mm -hmm. the same, oh, there's so much for me to learn about it. But yeah, it's been a long journey so far. I've been, I've been sharpening the X, so to say, Absolutely. for many, I'm many years now. So years. yeah, I like to think that I'm a a general practitioner that knows his way around uh, pretty much everything that discipline has to offer. But I just mentioned what I'm uh, actually putting time into recently, which is improving the way that I interact with the, the people who we interview in laboratories and so on. Um, I don't feel like I'm that good at that, to be honest. Lots of margin for improvement. Shout but out to Alice, by the way. The sh shout out to us. But the fact that you're working on it is of course, going to help. And also, it just shows that optimization is such a diverse field where you're never done. You're never done learning. You're never done optimizing your client's website. So yeah, I mean, 13 years in this space is absolutely impressive. So the main, the main problem with uh, customer journeys and the way they're optimizing, optimized, uh, most people think about them in, in terms of optimizing touch points. And that's okay. Like, that, that's a good starting point. But, you know, what else do we need to look at there? Like, What's missing from that picture? Yeah, I feel like what we end up missing here are the smaller manifestations of intent. So as optimizers, as experimenters, we tend to place a lot of emphasis, a lot of our focus on end of funnel KPIs, right? Such as the conversion rate or the revenue itself. And then we talk a lot about optimizing user experiences. It sounds so nice. But the reality of things is that most of us end up optimizing page templates instead or just page sections instead. And this is something that I'm loosely quoting from David Menheim. He said something like that recently. Stages, uh, not he's pages. He's been a guest here as well, right? Stages, so not pages. Exactly. It, 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 it's yeah, coming exactly. out next week. Yep. Yeah. So I personally believe that there is a lot of value in making this extra effort to look at smaller, more subtle signals, so to say that exist on the way to a conversion, such as interactions, um, no matter how small they are, and here I'm referring to events, really. I like to look at traffic sources. I like to look at previous and next pages that have been visited. I like to make notes of which expectations have been created um, during the navigation in these previous pages or what has been seen before in marketing campaigns, whether they're being matched in our pages or not, and so on. 
So I think that before anything else, we need to understand once and for all that thinking in terms of customer journeys tends to be more useful to us as experimenters compared to thinking in terms of just isolated touch points, you know? That's mm. my standpoint on the on the topic. Right. And are there any tools that can help you with this? Mm. This is an interesting question because the minute you start looking at customer journeys, you realize that they are a complete mess. Mm. So we need practical ways to optimize them. There is way too much data. There is way too much granularity. And when we think about customer journeys, most people think about the holy grail type of customer journey, right? That journey with absolute linearity in which visitors, they start on step one and then they behave super nicely and go straight to step two, then to step three and finally convert. But reality is nothing like that though, is it? Like navigation is super messy. People go all over the place and it's not always that you can find a clear pattern or a reasonable explanation as to why they're doing what they're doing. So ultimately, if you try to map all individual journeys that exist on your website right now, you're going to end up with a salad of possibilities that doesn't really help you optimize anything at the end of the day. There's way too many paths being taken. There's way too many ways to reach a conversion. So even nowadays, you're asking about tools, for example. So even nowadays with all the super powerful AI models that are available, it's still hard, at least I find it hard to slice and dice journeys in ways that make it really possible to easily analyze them and start coming up with improvements. So in terms of tools, there is literally only one that I recommend for the job right now, and that is Full Story. They're probably the only tool that is doing a decent enough job at helping us optimize customer journeys. There might hmm. be others out there, but I've extensively tested Full Story, and that was the only one that I felt comfortable with. Um, full disclaimer here, comfortable enough to become a partner and start mm -hmm. recommending the tool to, to my clients. But most companies out there do not have something like full story, right? So even before the tool comes into play, I feel like what we need here is a mental model to start making sense of all this mess that comes from customer journeys. And the mental model that I like to go for here, it basically has two bigger attention points. So attention point number one, Sunny, is that we should be thinking in terms of journey moments. Not everyone is ready to convert, but even so, these people that are not ready to convert, they might still visit pages that you're only exclusively optimizing for conversions. So here's the first point of contention and also the first point of attention. We should be thinking in terms of customer journeys. And then the second point of attention is that there are two bigger forces governing customer journeys at all times. And when you understand them both, optimizing becomes easier. So we can talk about this along, along the road here. Absolutely. And, and uh, I'll just ask, you know, when you say you, we should look at customer journeys and not as snapshots, basically, which, which is what a template is, that's one of the things when you hear it, of course, that's the only way to do it. Like, no one's going to say no to that. But why don't brands actually follow this path? Yeah, I think it's a matter of difficulty. It's way more laborious. It's way mm. more work to look at customer journeys instead of just taking whatever data you have available on that one specific touch point that you're going to get evaluated um, on. You know, you're basically getting your, your work is going to be good or your work is going to be bad. And depending on what you do, by the end of the month with that one touch point. So I feel like there is a bit of a culture clash here in the sense that for professionals in the experimentation field or similar fields to become able to optimize customer journeys, companies have to start thinking in terms of customer journeys too. And I feel like even now, even in, in, in this day and age, we still have very separate conversations. We talk about CX a lot, and then we talk about customer journeys a lot, but it, it may sound obvious to a lot of you listening to this right now, but it really isn't. If you don't make an active effort to mesh those two top topics together, they never meet each other because ultimately CX only goes as far as your own optimization scope goes. If you're not trying to optimize things looking at the bigger picture, you end up with like those smaller, more granular, initiatives, which don't get me wrong here, they're also good, they're also valuable, they're also necessary. But end of day, you are missing the big picture a lot of the time when you are optimizing like this. Oh, they, they matter for sure. Those, those small granular details, they matter, but 
stopping there is really what's killing what's killing the good work. And my theory is that Google Analytics, the old Google Analytics, is is to blame for a lot of this mindset because it was it was just there. The port, the reports were as they were. You can look at what happens in a page. You can look at landing pages. You can look at car checkout. And most people learned about looking at the journeys that way as a series of snapshots because there was this free tool that everybody was using and everybody was writing about, blogging about. And then, you know, I guess people were trained to think in terms of uh, snapshots and not journeys. So you briefly mentioned momentum and friction, like two two forces that that dictate how a journey will, will go. And in preparing for this podcast, one again, once again, you're, you're the most wonderful guest in terms of preparing for an episode, I, I, I could not believe uh, how, how well prepared I, the document you sent me, how great it was. You, you mentioned three types of friction, usability, cognitive, and emotional. How can you detect if, if, if it's any of these three is present in the customer journey? Yeah, so you have ways to do that. I could give you a quick explanation as to why those things are important and why to categorize friction. So just to give our listeners a bit more context behind this, I really believe that momentum is the name of the game as far as customer journey optimization goes. Every single step in a customer journey requires a certain amount of momentum to be met. If we do not help our visitors achieve, meet that amount of momentum, they end up leaving our websites, our apps, our experiences. And then when we think about classical physics, the stuff we studied back in school, What is the one force that is really good at stopping momentum? It's friction, right? So friction is basically our sworn enemy here. I know I'm aware that there are good types of friction, but like in 95% of the cases, maybe even more than that, what you want to be doing here is removing friction from your experiences. So the task of spotting friction barriers, friction points becomes a bit easier if we categorize it under certain types. And again, there are many, many ways to do that. But here at Looptimize, at my agency, we like to categorize it under three main types, as, you, as you've mentioned, usability, cognitive, and emotional friction. And I like to think about it as a hierarchy. So you start from usability friction, then it becomes easier to spot cognitive friction, and that in turn makes it easier to spot emotional friction. So the way for you to find that, of course, you can approach it from, from a quantitative side, But I feel like most people listening to this right now are outstanding at doing that. Because as you said, we've been educated to use Google Analytics for the past 20 something years, I guess. I'm not even sure if that estimate is right or not, but we've been doing that for well over a decade. It's close enough. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So we got good at it, right? It's not something that poses much of a challenge, but the problem is that you get really limited in terms of scope when you're doing that from a solely quantitative um, point of view. So again, if you know the friction types, if you know their explanation, I think you can just look at pages and do a heuristic analysis of sorts. But instead of going for your usual heuristics like clarity, distraction, and so on, think about them in terms of friction. So giving you just a quick rundown, usability friction comprises everything, every aspect of your UI, of the um, visuals of the page, that prevent people from carrying tasks um, the way that they want to carry those tasks out. So think about overlapping buttons, think about text that's way too small to read or when the font contrast is not enough. Think about um, moments where you have to scroll too much and then the scroll is a bit buggy, like it resets you back to another point on the page. This is all usability friction. This all talks about how you interact with the page and mechanically what is possible to do and what isn't possible to do, what is easy to do, what is not easy to do. It's all about reducing the level of ability that is required to browse a page or browse an app screen. Usability friction, that's the base of our pyramid. Moving one step up, we have cognitive friction, which is everything that makes your brain work harder than it's supposed to. So think about confusing messages. Think about when you don't know to which direction you should be going. Think about the classic CTA. It's the shittiest CTA ever. Next. What is next? What does it entail? Read more. Read more. Read more. Like, oh, Jesus, this is so difficult to to deal with from a cognitive standpoint because you have no idea of what is going to happen next. But confusion is not the only thing that gets under this umbrella, that gets put, excuse me, under this umbrella of cognitive friction. 
you also have cognitive load as well. So whenever you present too much text, whenever you force people to consume lengthy videos, whenever you put too many images or moving images on their way, that increases cognitive stress and therefore you're imposing some cognitive friction on the experience. And now talking about the top of the pyramid, the harder, the hardest rather type of friction to find. And yet the one that hides the, the biggest amount of, or at least the most impactful uplifts in your program usually, we have emotional friction, which is everything that lacks adherence to the context that has been previously established in the journey that you're going through right now, everything that is not really relevant to you, or everything that doesn't really speak to your heart. You know, things that make you feel uneasy can also be classified as being um, emotional friction. But end of day, that's what you have. Um, it's a pyramid, only three types. I think it's super easy to use. Start by trying to spot usability friction. If you can't find any points, that's probably where most of your users are, are getting stuck. But then move up to cognitive friction and from there move up to emotional friction. Try to think it as a try to think of it as a heuristic analysis. I like to take screenshots of all the pages that I'm optimizing for in the funnel. We're talking about journeys after all. Do not only absolutely, look at a single page. Absolutely. Friction transfers over to the next thing. So if you overwhelm your customers with cognitive load that is too high, for example, on the home page, they're going to be stressed out when they go to the next step. So keep that in mind. Of course, you don't always have full command over what you can show. Sometimes there are brand definitions that you have to respect and so on. But be mindful of those three types of friction. And I think you're in for a very, very nice time. It's it's much easier to optimize and to think about ideas, it, to think about good hypothesis when you approach it. It does sound much easier. It does sound a lot easier. And, and this, this concept of, of friction pyramid, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant because of how simple it is and because how easy mm -hmm. it is to understand. Explain to the client as well, which of course is very important there. So uh, in terms of, uh, uh, we're supposed to think in terms of not just snapshots and journey moments or pages or sections, but moments in the journey. and and. Does that apply to experiences that happen offsite as well, like ads, emails, email camp? So this is not about website optimization specifically, of course, the, the, the friction pyramid. No, I feel like the friction pyramid applies to everything. Like you can think about life from that perspective, but it right. still applies to a certain extent. Whenever you feel frustrated in real life, you can start thinking like, what types of friction am I encountering here? Why the hell I'm that pissed off at this experience? You know, you can usually find um, good answers by putting this through the prism of, of friction. But in terms of thinking like not only about friction, but also about journey moments, this does apply to offline experiences as well. Um, I think we have more documentation as a matter of fact, like it's being studied further when we talk about offline experiences, like the marketers, the, the OGs of the marketing mm -hmm. field, they've done a lot in that sense. But when we talk about like those online experiences, you do see a lot of people proposing models to, to um, classify those funnel phases, those funnel stages that people usually go through when interacting with your brand. But I don't see that getting used all that much when optimizing those pages. You know, I don't know many experimenters out there that include this way of thinking in their hypothesis crafting process. So I myself like to think that there are six key journey moments um, you could work with a model that has more than that. You could work with a model that has fewer than that. But ultimately, it's about making your life easier and about understanding which tasks your, your customers are trying to accomplish on your website. So in my model, which is not the absolute source of truth or anything like that, we think about awareness, which is when people are still learning that your brand exists. They are uh, maybe getting exposure on the landing page of yours. Maybe they are seeing your website right now. But exposure to your web properties is still minimal. People are still learning that you're out there. That is awareness. That's the key moment number one. Key moment number two is interest. That's when people go one step further and start checking your website in more detail. They start having a more involved approach to their navigation. They might sign up for your newsletter. They might come across other touch points that you have online as well. But they still don't know that much about your product. They're still not close to a purchase here. So moment number one is awareness. Moment number two is interest. Moment number three is intent. That's when people create an account. That's when they add a product to their wish list or to their cards. That's when they sign up for a demo. Right after that, we have evaluation, which is when people are going to start looking around and start assessing if what you're offering is really for them or not. They're going to look at competitors in this process too. 
And then you have conversion and re-engagement. So again, quick reca uh, recap. Awareness, interest, intent, evaluation, conversion, and re-engagement. I don't think you need more than that, but this is what people already know. The part that might be new to some people here is that, well, spoiler alert, every visitor, or let's think about it the other way, every page on your website is going to have to cater in one way or another to all the six moments that I just listed here. And this is where mistakes are being made, basically. When we think of a PDP, for example, a product detail page, there are so many articles out there, right? Saying that your PDP is supposed to cater to the people who are ready to buy, hmm. giving them information about your products, nudging them towards the next step, which is naturally adding a product to the cart and converting. So those are the tasks that we end up optimizing for. We, we want to make those, um, those tasks easier for people to do, easier for them to consume information, easier for them to click on the add to cart button and so on. But just because somebody's landing on a PDP, for example, it doesn't necessarily mean that this person is already in the intent, in the evaluation, or in the conversion moments of their journeys right now. They might not be ready to buy yet. As a matter of fact, this could be their very first interaction with your brand. In the, on, on this very PDP, this happens very often with Google Shopping um, mm. campaigns. So you need to prepare the PDP for those side tasks as well, for people who are not ready to buy immediately, but also for people who hope to find more exploration options, to see more products, maybe even learn a bit more about your brand. You need to prepare it for people looking for customer support channels and so on. I had a customer in the past, can I name names? I cannot name names, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I cannot name names, <laughs> that's I'm sorry. Fine. That's fine. I still have, the NDA is still ongoing. Um, <laughs> I had a customer running a Google shopping campaign. And if I'm not mistaken, there was this um, requirement from Google back then that forced you to show the product on the first fold, containing mm. the product details together with it as well, including all of those things in the first fold. So a lot of the real estate that you had there had to be dedicated to that. And my customer thought that by placing laser sharp focus on those products, making them look super nice, making their descriptions attractive and so on, that would be enough. But what the, this customer failed to see was that there was like 60% of their traffic coming into those pages as new visitors. They had never seen the brand before, or most of them had never seen the brand before. Conversions went up the minute we identified that and found out that people were hoping to find more discovery options. So they were not heading towards the purchase yet. They wanted to browse around. They started using the add to wish list feature a lot more. We got a lot more account creations as well. And then down the road, like two months later, one and a half months later, some of those people starting to converge. And then we started getting like those so desired uplifts, right? But it's all about journey moments. We tend to optimize for the one key journey moments, the most important one, on that very specific page. And we usually fail to think about this hierarchy of the information and think about other tasks that could be important too. And that, my friend, presents friction. That kills momentum for a lot of your, your visitor base. You know, Not everyone is ready to, to commit right now. That's a very good, I mean, if you look at an average e-commerce brand, the conversion rate, if it's 5%, that's good these days. So the 95% of people that are, not thinking about buying, you're doing nothing for them if you're basically just optimizing for conversion. But I, I guess optimizing a PDP for maybe not all six stages because re-engagement, for example, is not going to happen in the product detail page, not necessarily happen there. How do you actually do that? How do you, how do you optimize for multiple steps? What do you, what would you, 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 had, you mentioned wish lists, for example, what are some other strategies you can use? Yeah, so like, let's discuss this from a broader spectrum already, mm -hmm. like translating this into our daily lives at work. We always come back to experimentation and personalization when we try to eliminate friction and to build momentum respectively. So the actions that can really help somebody do something faster, more conveniently, and therefore the actions that are helping this person build momentum, those tend to be quite individual in their nature. Yes, there are universal things that you're going to do, and those are going to help the lives of like 90% plus of your visitors, but you extinguish those really fast. So to build momentum effectively, personalization is going to be your best friend. It's a more individualized approach compared to removing friction. What serves as a shortcut in navigation to one segment of your audience 
might hinder the progress of a lot of other segments of your audience. So in trying to create shortcuts, personalization is going to be your tool of choice. On the other hand, friction barriers, the three friction types we've described before, they tend to be a, li a little bit more general in nature. So making a button easier to press for one person will probably make it also easier to press for everyone else too. So when you remove friction, experimentation and A-B testing are going to be your weapons of choice. You're going to be tackling barriers that affect a larger portion of your customers, which conveniently ties back to our need for traffic when testing, right? A-B tests require quite a bit of traffic, and that ties nicely to the idea of eliminating friction. But getting practical here, Sunny, what I usually follow is a sequence of steps when trying to spot and eliminate friction. And the same goes when I'm trying to find opportunities to, to build up momentum. So the first thing that I usually do is to choose which pages I want to improve and decide at that spot already, at that moment already, which journey moments I want to try to facilitate on those pages. And then remember, people in all six journey moments we discussed before could be visiting the page or trying to optimize. So first things, the first thing is to choose which pages you want to optimize for, as well as the journey moments that you're going to be optimizing for on those pages. Step number two is to create an expectation matching list. So what expectations have we created for these people in those journey moments that we have to meet now? So again, back to what I said before, check previous pages, check marketing campaigns, check your highest um, CTR ads, for example, check traffic sources. The stuff we've said before matters a lot now. If you said A before, you have to say A again right now. You cannot say A in step one and then start saying B in C and D on step two. Task number three here is to think about tasks themselves. So now you know which pages you're optimizing for. You know which journey moments you want to facilitate. You have an expectation matching list. You know which expectations have been created. Now start listing the tasks that people living through those journey moments on those specific pages may need to carry out. Once you have that, now you start thinking about friction. And then I suggest that you do what I call internally here at Looptimize a friction barrier map which is a heuristic analysis in which you look at the pages that are part of this journey that you're trying to optimize, classifying each friction barrier that you can find according to the model we've discussed before, usability friction, cognitive friction, and emotional friction. Once you have that, if it's available to you, step number five here, run user testing. User testing is very valuable in this process. You're capable of uncovering like 80% of the issues on a page with just one user test, including like let's say 10 people, it's a super powerful way to understand where your visitors are struggling. And you can include websites from your competitors in this process as well to try and figure out which expectations are being set by them. Because if it's super easy to do something on a competitor's platform, that's what people are going to expect from your platform. That's the type of experience, the, the level of ease that they're going to want to find when browsing your website. So it's important to look around too. When you're done with that, try to start getting rid of the friction barriers you found in your research. Again, test it all out. A-B testing is going to be your friend here. And then finally, last step in our sequence here, combine everything with additional qualitative research methods in order to spot opportunities to create shortcuts, shortcuts, excuse me, in the plural, for each journey moment on that page that you're trying to optimize or on that group of pages that you're trying to optimize. So by qualitative research methods here, you can think of your session recordings, you can think of your heat maps and so on, but try to get more creative. There's something that is called the customer effort score, for example, which assesses how difficult it was for a customer to accomplish a task on your, on your website, on your page, on your screen, if it's an app. It can even be um, used in real life too. So use that to your benefit. Do uh, let me count just ask, analysis. how, how do you, how do you uh, evaluate customer effort score? Oh, it's basically just a question. It's just a matter of okay. presenting it in the right moment rather than how it's presented, rather mm. than what is the question. The question basically is how hard was it for you to do this thing that you just right. did right now? Okay. And then you can evaluate using it, uh, evaluate it, excuse me, using a Likert scale. I don't like zero to 10 scales. I recommend that you do, um, one to five scales. It avoids neutrality a little bit uh, or one to four in order to completely avoid right. neutrality. 
and making it easier for people to assess because sometimes it's difficult for people to tell apart a six from a seven. What is the difference between a six There's and a seven? There's no difference. There is no difference, of course. Yeah, I like smaller scales. Right. And as I said, um, you also have some other silly methods that I don't see people using enough. What was the last time you've counted the amount of clicks that are necessary from step one and all the way to a conversion? Have you done that? on the competitors as well. Do they require more clicks or less clicks? Do they require more text reading or less text reading? Do they force you to see more images or fewer images? Those look like silly exercises, but they really aren't because sometimes the truth is on the surface. You're digging super deep, but what you're looking for is basically the fact that you're asking for six more clicks compared to your competitor. And therefore his experience tends to be easier because of that. So image count analysis, click count analysis, scroll depth analysis, how far do I have to scroll to get to the point here? All of those are, are super valuable. Five second tests are, are valuable too. First click tests are valuable as well. So just as a quick recap for those listening, because I'm not sure if my explanation here was too clear, um, there are seven steps in eliminating friction, um, creating momentum builders during momentum boosting uh, moments in your journeys and also in optimizing customer journeys as a whole. So first, choose which pages you want to improve, decide which journey moments you want to improve. Two, create an expectation matching list. What have we created as expectations for these customers of ours? Three, list the main tasks those people living through those journey moments are trying to accomplish on your pages, the pages that you're trying to optimize right now. Four, run a friction barrier map. Five, run user testing studies. Six, start testing those things out, start getting, start getting rid of your friction barriers through A-B testing preferentially. And seven, finally, do qualitative research and start figuring out uh, momentum building shortcuts. Seven quick steps. They're more qualitative than they are quantitative, and that is by design. I feel like we rely way too much on quantitative data, and that, that is, is the one true. type of data that is going away gradually, right? Yep. We have way more regulations than we had before. We don't have like the era of data gluttony that we used to live in over the past decade or so. This is going away. We got to get used to it. And that's a great thing. Let's be honest about it. As a, as a user I think of so the too. Internet, of yeah. Comes How with I... data privacy as well, which is like one of, as, as optimizers, it sucks to have less data. But as people, I feel like it's way better what we have now compared to what we have. I'll just add it. Yes, it does suck, but also relying more on first party and zero party data and, and knowing that this is data you can absolutely trust or mostly trust versus something you buy from a data broker, basically, when you're paying for ads. I, I think it's a way better way of doing optimization. I'll just say this. I don't think anyone has ever shared more knowledge in 30 minutes on this podcast than you have. <laughs> So yeah, this was very explosive. It was amazing that the, the friction pyramid, uh, I mean, it's mind blowing how simple it is and how, how true it is. Like it, it is one of the greatest things I've heard since I started doing this podcast from a guest. So with that said, uh, I have one last question for you. And that is, is there anything I should have asked you today, but I didn't? I think not. I think the script that we had here really allowed me to talk it about some good. of the topics that I'm super excited to talk about. And yeah, um, the beauty of the, the friction model that I discussed today with you, Sunny, comes from its simplicity. I completely agree with that. I feel like there are so many difficult ways to solve the problems and challenges that we run into when doing experimentation or just when trying to grow our brands. But when you run into or when you are capable of coming up with simple models that really apply to your everyday, that really enable you to make moves immediately, that's where value really comes from. So thank you for nudging me to what I consider to be the right paths here. It was a pleasure to talk about I, all those I concepts. agree, but, but also it takes knowing a topic really well to be able to explain it in a, in a very simple manner like the friction pyramid is. So yeah, that's it. I, I, I'm very, very thankful and very excited about this episode. This was a blast to record. I'm, 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 thank you, Andre, for being on the show. Uh, and to everyone who was listening, Please consider rating, reviewing, sharing with someone who will find it useful because this was extremely useful and I will talk to you next week.